Those are good stories. They seem simple, right? We didn't do a whole lot, like, in the grand scheme of things. Um, but we touched people's lives today. And I believe that when God's people go out, not just because we want to grow our church or not just because we have an agenda to do something, build a program or support the preschool, but because we want to do exactly what Jesus told us to do, to go out so that their lives, those people that we know who are weary, scattered, and like sheep without a shepherd, that they would be touched by God and that they would be changed and that they would be transformed and that they would know the love of God and the peace of God like we do. When we go out for that purpose, the ripple effect that Mark talked about is something that we won't even see. And I want to share with you. I'm going to take over now, okay? So this is your last chance. Too late. I already started. There are pictures, yes. Well, if you get us the pictures, we'll find a way to use them. Okay? So, so yeah, just give them to me. Yeah. Facebook. I saw some Facebook ones today. Yeah, that's awesome. Hey. Uh-oh. Sorry, guys. That was me. There's a mic stand here, and I put it on the table. <laughs> do you have your Bibles tonight? Let's do this. Turn in your Bible to Acts chapter 2. I want to show you something. This is pretty cool. The ripple effect. What God is going to do based on what you did today, church. Um, and so we think, you know, okay, it was, f- it was fun. It was good to serve. It was good to give to somebody else. And we had some interaction with some people. But what's going to happen as a result of that? What's the, the bigger picture? And the bigger picture is really the God picture. What God does. Acts chapter 2. You remember when the church was first born? We call it Pentecost. It was at a Jewish festival. And that's why we call it Pentecost. And there's something remarkable that happened. It was 50 days after Passover. And the Jewish people were going through there. Um, getting ready for a festival and and on the very day that Pentecost started something happened remarkable a promise that God had made to his people Jesus said do you remember wait right here until this promise that I'm making you the Holy Spirit comes and the Holy Spirit will fall and that will be the sort of inauguration if you will the, the birth of the church and he says then when the Holy Spirit comes then you can get busy doing all the stuff that I told you to do. You remember? Something really remarkable. In Acts chapter 2, verse 1, this, uh, it says, When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord and in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire. Uh, one sat upon each of them. And look at verse 4. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And if you skip down to verse 7 and 8, it gives you a little more explanation of that fact. It says, verse 7, Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? So something, uh, the sign came, something remarkable that God did. And I think it's really important because there's something that God is showing us that we can trust and rely on now. When we go out, this was the birth of the church. You see, these disciples are about to go out and do the church stuff, build the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they went out in His power, but but it all happened right here with the coming of the Holy Spirit. This power of God, this thing that we can't explain, look like tongues of fire resting on people. And then, you know, for God just to show that it was Him, they began understanding one another even though they were speaking in their own native language. So this sign, this miracle, was very important because, I don't know if you remember, but way back in history, when God was calling His people to be His people in the Old Testament, there was a time where just the opposite happened. Instead of all their different languages coming together so that they can understand in unity God dispersed them and confused their languages. Do you remember that in Genesis chapter 7? The Tower of Babel or Babel, right? And that was when they, they built this tower and, and it built up to be God toward the heavens. And they said, hey, we can now do everything God wants us to do. We can be a people for God. And, of course, they had all kinds of um, 
greedy agendas to be, to be a people that conquered other people. But, but they wanted to be what God had called them to be, this, this people who would, who would represent the one true God. <clears throat> but the, the thing is, is they, they weren't ready for that yet because they were still too filled with pride and sin, and they were still learning the law of God. And so it was almost like God said, yeah, that's what I want you to do. I want you to be my people, but you're, you're starting too early to do that part. Not yet. We haven't dealt with the sacrifice for sin yet. And so he confused their language and scattered them. So then he led the children of Israel through this long journey. We learn a lot from God's dealing with the people of Israel. And then the day of Pentecost comes after the cross. and Jesus had paid for sin and given us forgiveness of sin. Now there was this opportunity for God's people to be restored in relationship to him without sin as a barrier completely forgiven because atonement the price had been paid for sin now it was time for God's people to take over God's mission and do what he wanted him to do and he shows that symbolically by reversing if you will the confusion of language to unifying the understanding of language now you're ready to go be my people now you're ready to go do what I've called you and asked you to do and the, the, the good part about that is the Holy Spirit comes and shows us that we don't have to worry about our own abilities and strength and power to be able to accomplish those things. God does those things. And so when does God do that in a church? When does God do the things only He can do? When do people get saved? Lives transformed and changed. Marriages restored. Broken people finding healing and peace. When does that stuff happen? The God stuff. It happens when his people get together by faith to be his people, like we did today. It seems simple, right? We go out and we're just gonna, we're gonna give some baked goods and we're gonna tell, tell people, hey, we really appreciate you and care for you and we're, we're here to serve you for a couple of hours and, and they're gonna be impacted by that. But the bigger picture is God is impacted by that. God is moved to do the things that only God can do when his people own the burden and responsibility of being his people. They accept his call. We accepted God's call today. Do you realize? Now, now we can't do this every Sunday because then I wouldn't get to preach and that'd be no fun. <laughs> Doesn't that seem even silly saying? But do you realize that today we were more the people accepting the call of God than on any other Sunday all year long? You realize that? There's nothing wrong with what we do. We're gathered for worship. But, but the idea is that we are to be people when we accept the call of God that we do like the first church did and receive God's power and spirit to do what it is that God wants to do. What did he come to do? Seek and save that which is lost. And that's what we were doing today. And the result is, if you skip down a little further in Acts chapter 2, we see what kind, what God, what kind of things God does. Verse 40. And with many other words, he testified, ex exhorted them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. So now they're filled with the Holy Spirit, and they're talking about Jesus being the way. Verse 41, then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship and in the breaking of bread and in prayers. And then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Time out. You can write in the margin right there next to verse 43 in parentheses, God stuff. That's the stuff that God does that no man can do. And when does he do, when does he do that? He does those things when the people begin to gather as his people and do what he called them to do. They accepted the call, but they also advanced by faith. They began to do things that God called them to do that they couldn't do on their own. Fear came upon every soul. Many wonders were, were performed. Verse 44, And then all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all, anyone who had need. And so continuing daily with one accord in the temple with breaking of bread, from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity, praising God and having favor with all the people. Now watch this part. The last part's important. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. 
You see, they accepted the call, but they also began to advance by faith. I want to show you something. In what way did the first church, this is like the church that's literally hours old, right? In what way did they already accepted his call, but began to advance being his people by faith? You know what that means, right? That means I'm going to do what Jesus said to do right here, even though if I do it, there's no way it's actually going to work, right? I can't produce what needs to be produced with my hands, with these efforts, with, with this meager offering that I have. But, but I'm going to do it anyway. Why? Because I trust that God called me to do that. And when I do it, then he will provide that X factor. He will come in and fill the gap to do the work that I couldn't do. But he doesn't do that until what? Until I begin to do what he says to do with what I have. And they, they, they took it so literally. I, I just wonder what kind of impact this would have. I, I've been looking for a church to do this. I, I don't know if we're going to do it. But they actually like sold all their stuff and pulled all their money together and just provided. You see, that sounds like a commune, right? Like they, they just like, I'll get rid of everything I have. And then if you have need, I'll share with you. And I don't know what that would look like in church today because we live in a different culture, right? And that's almost weird today. But... What a remarkable step of faith to take everything that they had for themselves and to liquidate it to be available for those who had need. What a huge step of faith. What were they trusting? That even though they sold their retirement and their property and all their stuff, that God was going to still provide for them, right? And the miraculous result of God was not just that they all were hungry, um, no, no longer hungry, they were all fulfilled, right? They had peace and joy. That, that wasn't all that happened. In verse 47, the Lord kept adding to the church daily those, hey, stay with me, who were being saved. Eternal life. Every single person from the result of their, of their advancing by faith and trusting in God's way instead of their own, that was converted from being lost to being saved meant they did not spend eternity separated from God in hell, but instead would receive everlasting life and the forgiveness of sin. Forever. Forever. How much more important is that than me storing up some possessions and some money in my bank account? Right? They saw that, but they saw it when they advanced by faith. So they accepted the call, they advanced by faith, and, and they actually acted out on his plan too. See, when does God's power move in the church? It's when we do what they did. We accept his call, we did that today. We advance by faith. We're going to begin to trust God that he will provide, and we're going to act on his plan. You did that today, church. You, you, you exercised those spiritual muscles of faith acting according to God's word. And it may seem, um, maybe it doesn't seem minor to you. Maybe it was a big, huge day and it changed your life. But you might be wondering, you know, what's, what's the big deal? The big deal is that you and I said, God, we believe you. You called us to be your people and we're going to act out by faith and to do what you told us to do. And we want to see what you can do that we can't do on our own. And I want to live that way. So I'm exercising those spiritual muscles. Let me show you almost time to close. I have one more really cool thing that I want to show you that I think will help you to understand that. But do you want to see it tonight? Should we save it for another time or should we do it tonight? For tonight? Okay. Check it out. You notice how I did that? I got your permission first. I'm tricky that way. You'll learn. No, no, actually, I, 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 I really think you'll enjoy seeing this. Something else happened behind the scenes on the day of Pentecost. Not only was it God's inauguration of, okay, now go be my people and do what I want to be done. Confusing of the language when you weren't ready. Bringing together an understanding of language when you are ready. He also wanted us to be a people that represent his nature. If I say God, give me one character trait 
of God, the first one that comes to your mind, what is it? Love. God is love. <clears throat> the first church, their step of faith was to love one another radically. That's pretty radical love, right? We bought some, some cookies and treats and took them out and we maybe some supplies for cleaning up. That, that, that was cool, but, but we didn't sell everything we owned type love, right? They gave everything they had and that began to bear fruit. Do you know that we are now able to be God's love like we never were before? How many were saved this day where they started acting out God's love and being God's love? About 3,000 souls, it says. Doesn't it say that? In fact, I want you to make sure you understand that. Verse 41. Mark it. Underline it. There's something significant about that number. 3,000 souls were given life. They were not only given life, but they were enabled to be the love of God from that point forward. If you turn back to Exodus chapter 32, in verse 28, we find an example where they weren't able to be God's love. In the Old Testament, God's people were still learning that they were under the law. In fact, on the very day that God gave them the law, which, by the way, was the first Pentecost. It's the giving of the law, the Ten Commandments, when God gave them to Moses. Do you remember? And Moses had God's law written on the tablets of stone, and he came back down off the mountain, and he was so excited. Look, God told us how to be his people. And he brought, and what did he find when he came down to the camp to share that with all the people? Were they all faithfully loving God and loving one another, living out God's ways in holy purity? Not hardly. Remember they had fashioned the golden calf? They, they, they formed this idol to worship. They were grossly breaking God's law the very day God gave them the law. You remember? And Moses was so hacked off when he came down, like you and I would be. He threw the tablets down. They broke. He was like, what? Are you kidding me? God just gave us his law so that we know how to obey him and be his people and find peace, joy, and love and all the things that God is and God wants. And he comes down to find out, you know what? No matter how hard we try, we are flawed people who just cannot keep the law. We just can't do it. And where did I say you were in? Acts, Exodus 32? In, in verse 27, this was God's response. And he said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Let every man put his sword on his side and go in and out from the entrance to the entrance throughout the camp and let every man, watch this, kill his brother, every man his companion, and every man his neighbor. Verse 28. So the sons of Levi did according to the word of Moses and about 3,000 men of the people fell that day. You see, on the day where God's law was something that we just weren't able to do, God poured out his wrath, his judgment, and 3,000 souls were killed judgment consequences of disobedience is death and separation from God right but when Jesus came to show God's love he died on the cross for our sins and then he said wait here for the Holy Spirit and when he comes then something will happen and the Holy Spirit came that day and fell on each one of them and, they, and this remarkable sign that they all understood one another's language was like, okay, now you can be my people and now I'm trying to show you it's time. And on that very day, they began to love one another like they have never loved one another before. They began to live out the things that God told them to do instantly because he empowered them in their forgiveness to be able to, I love this, be God's law. The law on the tablet brings death and frustration and separation. 
But the law then that comes to live inside of the heart of his followers becomes everlasting life, becomes love. You see what God's doing? We think sometimes salvation is just so that I can go to heaven one day and be forgiven of my sins. Yeah, that's part of it. But it's also this. God wants to be able to fill you so that you can go enjoy being God's love, not just receiving it. And that day where 3,000 souls were saved instead of 3,000 souls killed shows us that we now can live out God's word. We can be the commandments, the laws of God, the ways of God, the purity of God, the grace of God, the love of God. And how do we do that? By obeying his word. Venture, that's what we did today. It's no small thing. We said, you know what? It's going to be a sacrifice and it's going to cost us a little bit, but we're going to go out and accept the call of God. We're going to advance by faith because there's no way to explain what might have to happen and we're going to act on his word. We're going to give because it's more blessed to give than to receive. We're going to love others because it says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and then love your neighbor as yourself. We're going to put other people first this morning. Instead of coming and enjoying a nice service, we're going to go out and work and sweat and give that cost us a little bit. Because consider one another's needs before your own. You see what we were doing this morning? We were living out God's ways. We were living out the word of God. People today saw a glimpse of the nature, character of Almighty God. And when they said, why would you do that? That's weird. They're just here because that's who God is. Why would he forgive our sins? We're not worthy of it because that's who God is. Why would he f- invite me into a relationship and give me all that he has? Me. I don't, I'm not worthy of that because that's who God is. And I just want to invite you to trust God with me that we did exactly, just in a little exercise, but it was accurate, and authentic. We did what God told the church to do this morning because we are trusting God to be the one to bear the fruit and not ourselves. So the ripple's going to go out and we're going to have to fill this room twice and then we're going to get a building and then we're going to fill that building and people's lives are going to be changed and your life's going to be changed and my life's going to be changed. And a couple years from now, we're going to turn around and look back and say, you remember that day when we went out and ventured out and we talked about God's going to do things that only God can do? And the testimony is going to say, God is doing things that we never thought or imagined that he would do right here in our midst. I'm asking you, Venture Church. I'm asking you, do you believe that? I mean, do you believe it? Because I'm not here to play church games. I hope you're not. I'm here to do what God wants to do and see people's lives changed. To see the gospel go out and disciples made and the world turned upside down because of a small group called Venture Church who trusted God to do what only he could do. That's what Venture Out was all about. Let's pray and trust God to do those things, shall we? Pray together. You pray with me. Let's just... We're going to talk to God together. When you leave, after our prayer, I'm going to ask you to also trust God with tithes and offerings. There's a box back there. It's a little box with the cross. Guys, listen. I'm about to pray, okay? Hold on. We, We took a step of faith today by going out and not collecting an offering because the bills still have to be paid and supplies. We, that's why people don't do that on Sundays because you miss the offering. We don't care about that, do we? We care about what he's doing in our heart. Make your offering today when you go by that box or put it on the iPad or whatever. Make it about, God, I'm trusting you. I'm accepting your call and I'm trusting you with my life and I'm sharing my possessions with others. Father, thank you for saving us, sending Jesus, our Savior. God, we sang about it. 
we prayed about it. We, we, we've come together to celebrate it. But God, thank you for really doing that for us. And we pray tonight that as we went out today that um, every cookie and every piece of trash that's picked up or weed that was pulled, smile that was given, Lord, we just lay that at your feet. And we ask you to do what only you can do. We, we did it by tr- trusting you, by being your people, by living out your word. So God, somehow, according to your great power, move mountains with our meager offering this morning that we gave and change this community to your glory. Thank you for blessing us. What, what a wonderful church we have and we are. And we thank you, God, because you, you receive all the glory. We worship you tonight. We trust you to do great and mighty things. In Jesus' name we pray.